Welcome back. This is episode 101. Let's keep this thing going. I'm really enjoying talking with a lot of great artists, and today is absolutely no exception here in springtime 2023. Is with Parker Gispert. He had fronted a band called The Wigs and has done a lot of great solo work. He's one of many people who are in Nashville. And over in Nashville, they have a really wonderful uh, creative community. So they get together and just support each other. It's it's a lot different than those other markets. We always touch on that. Every time I'm talking with somebody in Nashville, they just talk about how great it is and how supportive everybody is of one another. This is absolutely a fun interview. We spoke about uh, connections here in the Atlanta, Georgia area and uh, everything that has really inspired him, including music from the 1990s, if you can remember that era. Anywho, enjoy. You're in your basement. Uh, Where is your basement? Where are you located this morning? I'm in East Nashville, Tennessee. A lot of guests. Yeah, a lot of people. I'm here in Atlanta. Oh, you are? Yeah. Nice. Where at? I live about 20 minutes north of Atlanta. I'm in Peachtree Corners. Oh, my God. Too funny. I grew up on Holcomb Bridge Road. Uh, My parents still live there in in Roswell, Alpharetta area, but like, you know, right next to Peachtree Corners pretty much. Uh, Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 I'm up that way all the time. So did you go to Roswell High School? I didn't. I I went to Westminster, which um, was yeah. a little bit of a commute. Um, but I went to Esther Jackson Elementary, um, and my parents still live in Horseshoe Bend, which is over there. Oh yeah, uh, I go that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh wow! <laughs> Small world. Wow. Small world. Too funny, man. <laughs> Did you grow up in the Atlanta area too? Uh, I came here from Cleveland, Ohio, uh, more than three decades ago. So I'm practically a native. You know how that is in the Atlanta area. Like nobody's from here. It's true. You were probably a rarity, but then you went off to pursue your musical dreams. So growing up, uh, you must have like really been into this uh, being at uh, Jackson and Westminster. Did you get into music very, very young or was this like way when when you were way older? Um, No, I got into it pretty young. I would say maybe less music specifically. I got into performing. Um, I just liked an audience. Um, I was doing plays in school. I was singing in choir and taking piano lessons and doing all that kind of stuff. But I'd say I started pursuing it seriously more uh, high school. Later in junior high, I got my first guitar when I was maybe 14. And then uh, that's when I really started getting focused. Yeah, that's when you really wake up to it. So who who inspired you around that age to to get into it? I'd say maybe Bob Dylan. Um, we were doing a junior high chorus concert, and me and a few of my friends were singing a choreographed dance to Happy Together by the Turtles. Um, that's a good one to do. Well, you know, which is fine enough, but... You know, I was in seventh grade and there was an eighth grader who came out after me and he was playing acoustic guitar and singing Bob Dylan songs. And it was just like, man, this is so much cooler than my choreographed dance. I need to get it together. Um, But I'd say mainly grunge rock that was on the radio at the time. You know, I was a child of the 90s. So all that stuff made a big impression on me. Um, And then Dylan, the two of those. So you grew up with uh, the old radio station, 99X, which has recently returned to the area. I that did. Was pretty big. Yeah, I did. So that was huge for me. And in going to Westminster, I had a commute every morning and uh, every day after school and with traffic, it would take about an hour. So I would listen to the morning X on the radio, just sitting in carpool to and from school, <laughs> um, you know, really absorbed all that stuff that they're playing that's yeah that's like the core of my introduction to uh music in a way i gotta say 
yeah <laughs> yeah being here and i remember when they started it was power 99 and they turned it and for those who don't know and there were probably a lot of radio stations that were like that uh, all across the u.s and, and all these markets but 99x was you know much different and i remember when they started and they were like we're gonna do just alternative i remember them advertising that at the second Lollapalooza, which they had over at Lakewood, which yeah. is an outdoor amphitheater. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I love the logo. And that like, was the beginning of grunge. And they really got into it. And then all these great bands, which is very evident on your latest project, how much they influenced you. Uh, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, all of them. It was just a really unique time that 99X was going through. It's true. It's it's funny um, trying to describe it to folks younger than me, um, but it was this great time, I thought, where like some of the most popular music in the world commercially um, also really spoke to me artistically, you know, like Nirvana and Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and all that stuff. It really, um, you know, I thought it was music with integrity that was also yeah blasted everywhere and everybody knew it and um you know you could go to school and talk about it with your friends and we were all listening to the same thing um you know it wasn't so scattered as it is now with streaming and it wasn't so like isolated and niche based it was there was still like a um something that we were all tuning into to discuss you know yeah, there was a lot of common ground with uh, terrestrial yes. radio back then. And, and you yeah. know, a lot of us could relate to it. Now it's just like, it's so different. You're competing in a way different space. Yes. Yes. Totally is. I love that about Nirvana. And when I first stumbled on them, it was like, this isn't heavy metal. It's not this disorganized sound. It's like, it, it's hard edge, but organized in a way. It's just very catchy. You know, it still has the pop elements, but just like it had some just serious gusto to it. So it seems like it, it's inspired you on your latest release, which is now st available streaming everywhere. If you could let us all know where we can get your latest, uh, your latest project. Yeah, Golden Years is my new album, and it's on all the streaming services, and you can also get a vinyl or a CD copy from myself at parkergispert.com um, or from the record label newwestrecords.com. But yeah, um, definitely some heavy Nirvana influence on the new album. Um, obviously, a, a giant fan, and, and to your point, I read his uh, journals um, mm. when they came out and I was revisiting them um, when I was writing this album. And yeah, it's, it's super deliberate what Nirvana is. It's a very focused, very intentional um, project for Kurt. You know, I think um, some folks might not realize um, how focused he was and how clear of a vision he had for everything from lyrics to directing music videos to what their t-shirts looked like um you know it was all really intentionally by design yeah. um yeah which yeah. i loved and um you know that inspired me on on my record too it's you know it's from from my point of view it's a very deliberate uh methodically thought out record you know so golden years you recorded all up in nashville did you do it in the same studio or you, and throughout covid a lot of people were just sending each other files and not doing it so much live in the studio yeah we were doing it live in the studio um i guess we were recording it in spring summer it, it was may 2021 so you know people were vaccinated and um it, it felt comfortable. It, it was kind of past that time where everybody was a little freaked out. So, yeah, we were all in the studio live in Nashville and had a great collection of people in there. Uh, the producer, Roger Mutno, legendary producer, mixer, um, and, and then my band, uh, you know, collection of folks from in town who I've known for a long time. So there was... There's good synergy with everybody. Everybody works really well together. Yeah, Roger's legendary work with Lou Reed and That's right. a couple of other big names. Really, That's really right. must have a great air 
because it sounds great. This is a great uh, new project. And it's Thank been out so since yeah September 2022? Yes, sir. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, you could really feel it in there. And uh, mastered by John Baldwin, which I That's think right. is a pretty big name up there, too. So were you just like, how, how did that come together? How long did it take to record and then for them to master and get it all out for a reason? Please? So um, I guess it took me about six months to write the record and then from there i went in with the band uh maybe three times we did a rehearsal ran through the songs and then we went into the studio with roger and we recorded the guitar bass and drums for all the songs in two days and then I sang all the songs in one day. And then we spent two days on lead guitar, two days on background vocals and piano. Um, and then that was it for tracking. So that's, I guess, maybe about eight days for tracking. And then, um, and then from there, we kind of just lived with it. We had some rough mixes on the board, but Roger and I would just stay in contact and you know, I would leave for a week, we'd listen to where we were at, make a few tweaks, he'd leave for a couple weeks, we'd come back, make some tweaks, we'd go into the studio, listen together, we just sort of tweaked it on and off um, for maybe, I don't know how much time that was, maybe a couple months, but, you know, it wasn't every day, it was sort of just like you're just living with it and listening to it and, and tweaking it, and then I would say, uh, once we were done with that, it got mastered probably in November, like into the fall. John Baldwin mastered it and uh, then it was done. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great title. Where does the title come from? It's from the title track, obviously. But uh, how did that get inspired? And why did you name the uh, album Golden Years taken from the title track? Yeah, I think um, originally I was going to call it Rock and Roll which is another song, a, a, another song on the album. And there's a lot of albums called rock and roll. Right. Um, the, the, the first album, the first solo album of mine is called sunlight tonight. And I made a real point to, you know, look up, is there any other album called sunlight tonight? You know, search on Spotify or Apple music. And it's <laughs> like, no, there's not. Is there any other song called Life in the Goldilocks Zone or Do Some Country? And there wasn't. You know, I made a real point to have titles that no one else had. And I flipped the script on that with this record. So, yeah, Rock and Roll or Golden Years or some of these titles are titles that have been used before, but I wasn't afraid of that. And um, originally, Rock and Roll was the leadoff track on the album. So, and then I flipped the track listing and Golden Years became the first track on the album. Um, and it just felt right. It just, for whatever reason, um, mm -hmm. you know, I tried to come up with a title that wasn't a song title and I failed. So then I just ended up going with the, the first song on the album. Yeah, sometimes it's better to go with the gut and not overthink anything. It's, it's true, it's, it's true. I came up with some some not good ones when I was going off script. Yeah, it's totally okay to use titles that have been used before. I mean, it's been happening in the mainstream world for years now, like just the way you are. It was originally Billy Joel's song, then Bruno Mars used that title. And there's so many examples. So Golden Years, yeah, I'm sure there have been some David Bowie tribute bands using that. So it's just, it's okay as long as you, you, you got your unique voice to that title. So, I mean, when I first saw that, I was like, oh yeah, that's cool. It's uh, and that's good to have that as the leadoff single. Isn't rock and roll kind of a longer track? It's um, it's 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 not longer per se, but it's at the it's near the back of the album. Um, and it maybe didn't end up being like a focus track. Um, and to your point about Bowie too, it's like I don't mind that association either. Yeah, it's like if it was um walking on the sun and it was it reminded someone of like a smash mouth song or something no offense you know whatever like maybe that 
would be not the association that I was comfortable with, but you know, someone associates the title with uh, David Bowie. It's like, that's cool. I, I'm down with that, you know? Yeah, it's totally fine. And it's not like a disappointment right. when you go to play it. Like, this is a great song. It's This Thanks. isn't a cover of Bowie. <laughs> it's like, right. I think uh, I think Maroon 5 had a song like, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, is it a cover of that Phil Collins song? No, it's not. It's it's <laughs> their own and they made it their own. Nice. Nice. Nobody, nobody has a lock on an actual title. So that That's totally fine. But yeah, nine tracks on here. Really great. Coming up with lyrics. How does that strike you? Are you doing lyrics first? Do you have the melody in your head? Does it all come at once? Um, normally melody first. Um, I'll kind of write down things that I want to write a song about, you know, conceptually. Um and I'll sort of look at like the nine tracks and and say like here are the things that I'd like to cover. Um, and I'm always writing lyrics, but it's rare that those end up in a song. Um, so it, I'd say it was a little bit all over the place on this record. Definitely melody first, but some of the songs I more or less wrote lyrics and music at the same time, which doesn't usually happen for me. Um, Evil Euphoria, I more or less just wrote that song in one sitting. Um, or You and I Forever, more or less just wrote that in one sitting. Um, but for the most part, it's typically a melody. And then I got to go back and, uh, you know, think about what the song's about and uh, write the lyrics uh, to, to that rhythm. Yeah, Evil Euphoria has a great riff. Uh, how how was that inspired? That, that really stood out to me. Uh, just an amazing guitar riff. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, what we were talking about earlier with 90s, um, I was listening to just a generic 90s playlist on Apple Music, and it had all these really well-known songs from the 90s on it, 90s rock. And... Um, I guess an obvious example would be something like Inner Sandman, where it's like it starts with the riff on an acoustic guitar and then the band cranks in and you just play the same riff, but loud. Um, you know, I was basically trying to do that. So I had the loud riff to Evil Euphoria, um, but then I just stripped it back for the intro and made it soft and so that it sort of has like a, different uh dynamic to it when when the band comes in rocking with me so assembling all the musicians you work with uh, everybody in nashville people that you've gotten to know over the years yeah um the drummer john kent was the newest to the equation he moved here right before the pandemic from texas and um we got connected through a mutual friend he um played with Ben Queller on the first couple Ben Queller albums. Him and Ben had a band when they were teenagers called Radish. Um, and then uh, John went on to play with the Lemonheads and is a great singer songwriter in his own right. Um, so I started with John and then um, the bass player is a session musician who was in Deer Tick for a long time. Um, and the pianist Thayer Serrano She's an old friend of mine from Athens, Georgia, where I used to live. She's played with all Athens bands like of Montreal or Drive by Truckers or Camper Van Beethoven and Cracker and um, really close friend of mine. And uh, Evan Scott Penza is the lead guitar player who's featured on a lot of these songs. There's a lot of great guitar solos and lead guitar parts. And um, yeah, Evan toured with me a little bit on my first solo album. And it was fun to have lead guitar. I'd, I've been playing rock music for about 20 years, but it weirdly have never had a lead guitarist. Um, so that was fun to, when I was writing the album, to leave space for um, his skill set. You know, I know what his abilities are, and I could kind of say, like, all right, let's leave a bar here. Uh, let's leave this section at the end for Evan to do his thing. Um, and that was really exciting. Yeah, that is. So did you play, did you go to University of Georgia? You were in Athens or just basically hung out there and got into the music scene? 
No, I went to University of Georgia, um, got a philosophy degree, and um, but I went there to play music. You know, I, I, you know, it was kind of a cover, keep the parents happy, and going to college. Um, but you know, I really went there knowing the Athens legacy. I was really into the Elephant Six Collective in Athens. Um, obviously REM and B-52s and that different generation of pylon and all that stuff. But um, yeah, I kind of looked around at other schools and just thought like Athens gives me the best chance to start my musical journey. So let's go there. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a great atmosphere, uh, Athens, and has been over 40 years now. I think yeah. there's a documentary I always wanted to see on that uh, that was about Athens and its music scene. It came out, I think, probably in the 80s. Athens, but, Georgia, Inside Out. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. I just watched it. I've seen it a ton of times, but I just saw it with my girlfriend a few weeks ago. It's like, you got to watch this. This is, you know, must see. TV for uh, music of the alternative era. Oh, yeah, it, it definitely the basis for that, too. And that probably inspired others. But back in the 80s, I remember because I went to school in Athens, Ohio. I was like, what's Athens, Georgia right. like? This is really a huge mystery to me. Yeah. And I stumbled on REM. And I remember Life's Rich Pageant when that 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 I totally got into. I was like this. I never heard anything like that. It just yeah. you know, really got me into it. I moved down here the same year B-52's released Cosmic Thing. And wow. that was just exploded. It's just like that that whole thing just, that's eventually what became the grunge movement and Seattle and all of that in the 99X. It's true. Yeah. Um, Life Switch pageant was the one for me also. That's the one that got me into R.E.M. And um yeah, that's funny. Athens, Ohio. I, I thought about going to school there myself. Um, and the Afghan wigs are from around that era, area, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's really, you know, another unusual town in southeast Ohio. And it was great for uh, communications and video production, which I got into. You know, nice. And a great music scene there, too. Heck yeah. Nice. Yeah, very, very inspirational. So you were playing live a lot back then. Are, do you plan on getting into more live performance now that we're somewhat well out of COVID? Yeah. So Sunday night, I'll kick off a tour. Um, it's about a month-long tour. I will get in my car by myself, and I will drive to Memphis. Then I'll go to like Austin, San Antonio, down to San Diego, LA, San Francisco, up to Seattle, down through Boise, Salt Lake City, Denver. Um, so I cover a lot of ground out there and um, it'll be a solo tour. So it'll just be me and a guitar on stage playing stripped down versions of the songs, but it still rocks and I can talk a little bit in between the songs and it's, it's a cool show. It's, it's different than the rock band, but um, it uh, it it's it's something that I started doing in recent years is doing the solo touring thing. It's just way more economical. Um, it just makes a lot more sense. It's hard to pay for a band and pay for hotel rooms and whatever the heck when you're gone for a month. So, but yeah, I'm I'm playing a, a good amount of shows and I'm hitting. I think I'm playing pretty much every night. So I got about you know, 25 ish shows that I'm going to be ripping through starting on Sunday. And that's uh, Sunday, March 26th. By the time we get this out, we'll probably be like during your tour. So okay, cool. like April of 2023, just for the, the, the time capsule here. So you're okay, going to be cool. there, all these cities you're driving all this way. I am. Yes. I drive every mile. I play all the shows, sell the merch. Wow. I do one man show. That's really cool. Now, what kind of merch do you can we see this on your website too? You got t-shirts, yeah. buttons, all that fun stuff. We, I do. I, I just introduced some hats, um, yeah. which is exciting. Um, but yeah, the, the merch is funny, man. It's 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 really fun for me. I I grew up just loving band t-shirts and um, 
I mean, even albums at this point are almost like a t-shirt-esque item. You know, it's almost like a novelty for some people. I can't tell you how many vinyl I sell and someone will say, like, I don't even have a record player, but this is so <laughs> cool. You know, it's like, all right. Um, but, but yeah, I, I get into the merch. It, it's really fun. How much vinyl do you have? A lot of people are not like getting into vinyl right now because it's kind of expensive. So are you able to press that many copies? I am. Yeah. Um, I actually sell a, a good amount of vinyl. Um, so, you know, I'll go out on the road with, I don't know, maybe a hundred esque. Um, and then, you know, you run out and you order more from the record label. Um, but, but yeah, I, I I sell a fair amount of vinyl. I still print CDs, which um, is a really niche demographic. Um, I always joke I can see the CD buyer in line. Um, you can just sort of like look at the merch line and be like, that guy's going to buy a CD. Um, <laughs> you know, and I love CDs. I think they sound wonderful and I love listening to them in my car. But um they've faded a little bit vinyls growing and cds are really uh dropping off yeah yeah i've noticed that <laughs> and vinyl is just so cool because you you can hold it it's big enough that's got you know great artwork if you choose to put that together with your vinyl package so and then the lyric sheets i that's the thing i always miss uh like going to the record stores and you know picking up vinyl you know turtles was a big uh store here when I first came, yeah, they were phasing on vinyl in favor of CDs going in from the eighties to the nineties. Yeah. It's great to see vinyl coming back. It's true. Um, I used to go to the turtles that was closer to Petrie corners, like near Spalding. Yeah. Um, I bought my first cassette ever there, which was weird. Al Yankovic, Alapalooza. Um, but yeah, turtles tokens at birthday parties, and whatever i was i love turtles man I, I miss that that's one of the other things that you know is just missing in modern culture to me is the whole record store experience um you know i learned so much about music from employees at local record stores and just like sifting through stuff listening to what they're playing in the shop um i really I, I know that there's still plenty of record stores and it's growing every year actually um, in recent years, but you know, it's just one thing where sometimes I'll hope that we just sort of look at the big picture and say, you know what? It was better than let's just go back to that. Cause it was so <laughs> much cooler. And uh, you know, I, yeah. I, I miss it. I miss it. It's an experience. And where I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, there was this neighborhood called Coventry. And we used to go and it was just the smell of the place. It was I think one of the record stores was like in a basement. They had like two record stores on that road. And it's just like, yeah, it's so cool. Maybe they were burning incense in there or something. It just like it was so neat just to flip through the, the, the you know, the, all the vinyl. But like here there was Wax and Facts and Wax Tree. Those yep. really cool places, too. independent stores, which I really, you know, there are a couple left and hopefully they are growing again. That's it's a, it's a great experience. It's true. Um, yeah. Athens or Atlanta. Yes. Wax and Facts. Um, so great. And um, God, what's the other one that's in Little Five Points that I'm blanking on right now yeah. um, that Some I love so much? Facts. Yeah, there's a, a few. Uh, there. Dang it. Um, but yeah, in Athens, we had low yo-yo stuff and walk street and then we had a school kids records which was a little bit of a regional chain there were like a few of them in college towns but um i'd say like a pretty big musical moment for me uh there was this band the glands from athens that i loved uh and i got to athens and i went into school kids records and their lead singer was behind the counter selling uh, me albums and it just blew my mind you know as a high school or whatever you just think of the people that you listen to as like untouchable um yeah. Yeah. people and it was like this guy's out here um you know owns a record store and i could ask him questions about you know what um replacements album i should buy or you know if i'm gonna get one 
Tom Petty record, what's the one or whatever the heck, you know? Right, right. And I had someone who I really respected musically, like guiding me on this uh, journey. So, yeah, that, that was yeah. cool. It's nice to have, yeah, somebody like that. Yeah, if you really want to get into a certain artist, somebody who can really suggest, yeah, what's their, you know, the album to get and then work from there. So it's yeah. nice to have experts around. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, gosh. So, uh, yeah, a lot of good songs on here. Nine songs. Do uh, you have a favorite out of this collection? Or it's just basically they're all your children and you treat them equally? They're all my children and I treat them equally. It's, it's um, you know, I, I would say anything that I ever put on a record with the wigs or as a solo guy, it's like, if you don't love it, uh no reason to uh put it out you know it always it always bothered me still does when i talk to an artist and i'll i'll say like um oh man i love that song or whatever and they're sort of like oh man you know are you i mean <laughs> i love rem but like you know you'll hear, hear michael stipe say like oh like stand i hate that song or something and you're like <laughs> why'd you put it on the album i love that song you know and it's like sad to hear uh, an artist like not like one of their own songs, you know. Um, I don't know. I just never have really understood understood that why you put something on that you don't love, but whatever. Yeah, probably at the time, you know, it was like, oh, we got to have a real hit on here. So and then right. you got it, then it gets so overplayed, and you're so sick of doing it. It's it's it's. And I'm sure a lot of artists go through that. It's like, but you have to do it. The audience came here to hear that. <laughs> it's true. It's true. They, they, you, know, you pigeonhole yourself, but Golden Years has a video out there, and we could see that on uh, your YouTube channel. Yeah, you can see it on my YouTube channel. You just search Parker Gispert Golden Years, or if you just want to go to my website parkergispert.com uh, I got the videos on there and and yeah there's one for golden years there's one for evil euphoria and there's a couple uh from my first solo album as well you enjoy doing uh music videos a lot of artists like you know they're like ah, I'm lukewarm you know I work so hard on the song got it down to the final mix I go out and play it live and everything I gotta do this concept music video <laughs> I, remember, I remember a lot of artists in the 80s saying oh I just don't want to have to deal with this but you gotta it's part of the whole selling this thing yeah I mean I grew up in VH1 MTV era so I loved seeing a music video and you know when I think of some of my favorite songs from that time i can see the music video in my mind they live together um so i think i love having them as a piece i always do get a little nervous like when i'm actually shooting it it's just a little more uncomfortable um you know the wigs my band started 20 years ago but i'd say and i've played hundreds and hundreds maybe thousands of concerts but i've shot nine music videos 10 music videos you know so it's just a part of the process that you're not used to doing so much of and you know it only happens every few years you shoot one um and then like i said i know how strong of an association it is so i really want it to be great and i want it to be um you know serving the song and um so i put a lot of pressure on it but um but once it's there, I'm I'm super happy to have it. And I love both the videos I did for this record. Yeah. Who did you get to direct that? And what's what's the concept of that? It, it looks great. It's a, it looked like it took some time to uh, do some effects and, and to edit that well as as well. Thanks. Yeah. Um, it was done by, I guess, sort of like a art house um, in Nashville called Indie Bling. Um, and they submitted a treatment and, um, it really speaks to what the song is about golden years, which is this idea that, you know, when these formative memories are happening in your life, um, that a lot of times you're not really like present enough to enjoy them. Um, I got the idea for the song. I was at my parents' house looking at old photos from like prom or, yeah, you know, even yeah. mundane stuff about like just 
sitting around on the couch and it's like you and three of your friends from the neighborhood like playing video games it's not even like a a big moment or something but you're looking at all these times going like oh man that was incredible like i had it made then um all the way up into present times too it's like but you know as those moments are happening you're probably thinking about you know this homework thing you got next week or some issue you had with this person that is over here it's like you're you're distracted in the moment and it's hard to really see that what's happening at any given time is you know really some of the best moments that you're ever going to have um so that's that's what the video um tries to encapsulate is um these different moments of your life and uh and trying to uh take a moment to pause and be present and just enjoy them and the people in the video do we do you know them or they were hired actors they were they were hired actors there's one the guy who plays the guitar solo in the music video um and he's also the dad in the music video he is uh the lead guitarist evan penza but other than him all hired folks um who i didn't meet until we were on set yeah very natural it seemed like a natural and it, it seems like you enjoyed uh recording that so it, it's good looking video on your youtube page thank you so much thank you yeah. yes and i did enjoy it uh speaking of the song and whatever it was like let's enjoy this making a music video it's gonna be here for forever you know if you're enjoying yourself people are gonna see that so aside from recording and writing and all of that throughout covid how else did you handle it did you do those facebook live concerts i did i did some um shows from my house just like in my in my bedroom uh i went through each wigs album and would play songs from that and talk about the songs. That was a little series I did. Um, so yeah, I did those. I was living outside of Nashville at a lake, Center Hill Lake. Um, and I was really in a perfect spot for the pandemic. I was far away from folks, um, a lot of nature around. So I did a lot of hiking and uh, tried to get into shape. I had been out on the road for a couple of years touring eating a lot of garbage, um, not exercising. So, um, yeah, I just embraced the time away from shows. To be honest, it was, I hate saying this because I know that it was a time of great suffering, great sickness, and a lot of sadness and financial hardship and lots of bad things with the pandemic. But for me, it was like one of the best times of my life, one of the best things that ever happened to me. I needed the break. I needed to get off the road and have some time with myself and uh concentrate on yeah uh, wellness and you know mental wellness physical wellness and uh writing a new record so yeah yeah, yeah it's a lot of hard work and you know it definitely shows in the long run so yeah i mean it's a kudos to you as well so this is your second solo album and yes sir how many did you have with the wigs? How many albums did you guys release? So we did five studio albums and one live album. So six total. So, you know, and then a couple solo albums. So it was my eighth album in a way. Yeah. How long did the wigs last? Was that straight out of college during it? How many yeah, years so were you? We, yeah, we started in college 2001, 2002. And then our last um, album came out in 2016, which was the live album. And we never broke up. So we'll still play a few shows a year. Um, our bass player plays in Kings of Leon now, oh. has been their band for a few years. And then um, our drummer was playing with Eagles of Death Metal. And um, he plays with... Amanda Shires and the Lone Bellow and Karen Elson and Band of Skulls. Um, he plays with all sorts of folks. So they're both still in the game. And um, 
who knows what the future holds. Maybe we'll uh, do something together again. That's great. Yeah. Connected with people who are Kings of Leon. That's I remember when they played over here, I think it stayed far Arena, or maybe it was Phillips back then. Yeah. I just, I totally remember that. That That's, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. That you're still uh, connected that way. So what do you hope to do in the future? Do you want to just keep going solo? Keep, keep on the same path. Um, in a perfect world, I would do both the wigs and solo um little mixture of both um i like writing for other folks as well um i wrote a song with alice cooper for his last uh, album paranormal um and co-writing is in the in the culture here in nashville um most of it's country so i wish hmm. there were more opportunities to write more rock songs with folks um but yeah i'd say solo stuff band stuff and then uh writing with other artists yeah how long have you been in nashville now 12 years yeah it adds up yeah it does good. man it flies it's crazy good community everybody who i speak with uh, from nashville they just love it they feel like yeah, this is not la we're not like in this crazy competition everybody's supportive it's it's a good community it is. It's, um, you know, I find myself telling people all the time that, at least for me, I moved here and I loved it originally, but I'd say like the first three years, um, I was sort of like, I don't know. I don't know if this is the place for me, you know, and then, you know, by the time I got to five years, I was all in and loved it. And now I love it more every week, every month. I'm, I'm super into it, but there was a little bit of like a curve where I had to like get over a hump and then it felt like home. Yeah. It takes time. And then you, it you, you get comfortable that way and you feel like you can thrive in a, in a great community like that. So yeah, kudos. Definitely. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And once again, where can we find you online? And you're on all the socials, I'm sure. Yeah, it's just my name, which is Parker Gispert, P-A-R-K-E-R, G-I-S as in Sam, P as in pizza, E-R-T. Um, yeah, ParkerGispert.com or just Parker Gispert on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. It's um, I'm the only one of me. No one else has my name. So that's good. Um, <laughs> must be like kind of a weird last name or different but um at least no one else pops up so yeah just type me in and i'll come up that's good i bet you have to do that spelling all the time because people are really like uh, it's not a hard name to say but yeah people screw up names all the time they do mine all the time it's just like it's not that hard come on yeah you're n-e-b-e-l it's and then Bob. yeah it, you know not that many letters not that hard but people always say nubble and it's really nebel but there's some people with my last name that just go by nubble sometimes i just let it slide uh it's it's so <laughs> hard to fight that but yeah it's uh yeah it, it's so easy how people screw things up yeah it's funny i'll, I'll get despair sometimes like people give me sort of like a <laughs> you became little, French. Uh, accent yeah and uh <laughs> A lot of times, like you said, it's just easier to not correct people. It's just like, whatever. <laughs> so true. <laughs> well, best wishes. Are you going to be playing in the Atlanta area anytime soon? Uh, do you play Eddie's Attic and places like that? I do. I actually just played Eddie's about a month ago. Um, and I'm sure I'll be through there this summer. Um, probably for a full band show, I would say. If I had to guess, maybe one of those uh, Sunset series at Park Tavern this summer but um tbd as as of now bob yeah cool you know places that i go to park tavern all those places uh we have the red clay theater up here in duluth places like that so yeah it's uh hopefully we could see you that would be great yeah i love coming to atlanta it's, i get to stay with my parents see the folks i grew up with it's always a good time oh cool. well thank you so much for stopping by thanks again bob i appreciate it man have a good one peace take care you too.